on our friends from Broadbrook. Um, and we are a group that cares very deeply about the meadows, um, in, mostly in Ward 3. We've been working with the city to um, hold CRs on a number of different properties. We're especially proud of our accomplishments this year. We've gotten our 501c3 nonprofit status, Yay. and we're working on um, a number of CRs with the city, including Mothview, um, Sheldon Field, and a new parcel behind the Pomeroy Terrace behind the College Church, where there's been a really active uh, helping crew building walking paths. It's wonderful back there, so I encourage you to come look at it. Um, we will have our annual meeting after this, so um, please stick around for that. Um, we'd love to invite you to be members. Um, Mac, our treasurer, will give you information about that. So, um, I, without further ado, I would like very much to welcome and thank Cynthia Butner for coming. She is going to speak about invasive plants. Um, she's a biologist for the Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. She coordinates the Refuge's Invasive Plant Control Initiative and works with numerous partners to rid the Connecticut River watershed of invasive water chestnut, promoting the concept of early detection, rapid response, linking New Englanders to the invasive plant information they seek, and planning invasive plant webinars and workshops. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I wonder if the lights could go down. They might have an easier time seeing the... But I don't want to mess you guys up over there either. Oh, we're okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm Great. Why do you do this? Okay, well, thanks a lot for that? inviting me. That's, yes. that's much better. Thanks. So, as Jane mentioned, I'm the coordinator for invasive plant stuff in the Connecticut River watershed. And that's because our... Refuge, the Silvio Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge, actually covers the whole Connecticut River watershed. It's a new concept in national wildlife refuges. And of course, we can't own all that land. Uh, we're sitting right in the Connecticut River watershed right now, and we don't own this school. Um, but we do own upwards of 36,000 acres now. When I first started back in 1999, we owned a 3.8 acre island in the Connecticut, Third Island, and that was all we owned. So it's a new refuge, and we've been um, gaining properties as time goes by. It's quite, quite hard to wrap my mind around that because we've grown so fast, I've never even been to a lot of our properties. And as you can see, it's a big area. Um, the stars and box at the top show where our main properties are. Um, the box is Nelhegan Basin, that's 26,000 acres. So that gives you a sense of kind of the, the distribution of <coughs> properties. Most of them are much, much smaller. And you m you're probably more familiar with Mount Tom, the old ski slopes. We own part of that. Um, Mount Tom complex in cooperation with Department of Conservation and Recreation in Massachusetts and the Trustees of Reservation. Um, the Fort River Division is in Hadley, back behind the malls on Moody Bridge Road. We've, that's where our, our field operations are centered. But what's closest to you guys and is actually connected with the meadows is um, off Hockenham Road. We own um, some of the land there where the old barrel pits are, where those two ponds are in the meadows there. So we own a, a swath of land in there, um, floodplain forest mostly. And then these, um, I'm not sure if it's just one pond or the two ponds. So, um, so actually, we're neighbors um, and might be fodder for collaboration or something. So we can keep that in mind. <laughs> So there's a lot of invasive plants out here. These are some of the more common ones in the Connecticut River watershed. We'll be talking today only about a few of them, those that we know for sure are on some of the lands that people were most concerned about, and that's um, garlic mustard, Asiatic bittersweet, or oriental bittersweet, and multiflora rose. So we'll get into a little more detail on those three species, but I'll be using some other species to try to get some examples across. It's such a big area, such 
um, a lot of species that in order to really feel like we're doing anything, we know that we have to prioritize, work on prevention, and work with others. No one can do um, anything major alone. And the other focus um, that we have is something I wanted to put up right up front and center. How many of you are familiar with purple loose Yeah, <laughs> kind of a poster child of invasive plants. And this is the kind of huge infestation that can happen with purple loose strife. Two million seeds per plant, high germination rate, unknown, unknown, unknown longevity of those seeds. So um, it doesn't take long for this kind of situation to happen. I wanted to mention to you about a coworker that I had back in 1995. That's when this photo was taken. This is my friend Gloria and we were working out in the Quabbin Reservoir area, Prescott Peninsula. There's this huge field out there and she saw this one purple loose strike plant and said, I know that doesn't belong there. I'm just going to dig that out. And so she did. She disposed of it properly. And just last year, I asked the land manager out there, okay, so what's the purple loose strife situation in that field? And he said, there isn't any. There is none. So that just really did my heart feel with that. You know, there's, there is a way to prevent new infestations, even with these common ones like this. So um, just keep that in mind, that there, if you have weed-free areas, try to keep them that way. If you see something new coming in, that's the time to really get them. So tonight what I'll cover is definitions, just so we're all on the same page. Um, some of the impacts that can occur from invasive plants. Some examples of species and their impacts and their control. And I'll focus on those three species that I told you about. And some of the other things that the refuge is doing. So for definitions, so a native plant, um, also called indigenous. So those are the plants that were here before European settlement. That's kind of the general definition. The local insects, birds, and mammals have um, co-evolved with them, as well as other plants. So they form this ecosystem, and um, the, the animals have, over time, learned to use these plants and um, <coughs> co-evolved along with them. <coughs> a non-native plant is just the opposite, a plant that was brought in either in intentionally or accidentally and um, has arrived since European settlement, sometimes from European settlement. Other names for that could be alien and exotic. And an invasive plant, <coughs> this is the Massachusetts definition of invasive, um, the, a non-native species that has spread into native or minimally managed plant systems. So those are as close as we've got to natural systems in Massachusetts. These plants cause economic or environmental harm by developing self-sustaining populations and becoming dominant and or disruptive to those systems. In Massachusetts, we include varieties, subspecies, the whole gamut. In other states, they don't do that. It's just the, the real species. And that, that comes into play the whole varieties and subspecies and cultivars issue when it comes to legal issues. Because here in Massachusetts, when we banned invasive plants, they can't be sold or imported within the state anymore, imported from outside the state. Um, it now includes all those cultivars and subspecies. In Connecticut, that's not true. So different states are dealing with invasive plants differently. <coughs> I like to think of invasive plants being the new kid on the block. Um, think about back from elementary or middle school days when the social order was determined, you know where you fit in that social order, and all of a sudden somebody, some new kid came in new kid on the block, and now all of a sudden, this new kid is smarter than most of us, faster, athletic, winning all the games, winning all the girls or boys. <laughs> Little did 
we know that, what's that? <laughs> Little did we know that back home, this same kid was picked on all the time, had the bullies and the whole bit, but now here in this new place, there's a whole new social order taking place. And um, that's what I think of when it comes to invasive plants. They're kind of the new kid on the block. They left behind their predators, their diseases. They came here and they may, depending on where they came from, they may have back there left, um, leaked out in April or May and left their leaves on until October. That was just a normal thing to do. That's what everybody did. And here they're doing the same thing, so they have a lo longer photosynthesis period than our native plants do. Um, some of them have a high seed production, a high success rate for those seeds. Sometimes they, those seeds remain viable for many, many years. Some have really successful seed dispersion or aggressive root systems. Some can thrive under a variety of conditions, light, shade, moist, dry. I already mentioned leafing out earlier. Um, and some can even alter the environment in ways that enhance their survival, such as change the pH of the soil or soil chemistry. They can cause heavy shading. So those are some of the ways that they can successfully dominate. And what does that mean for our native habitat? Well, they can usurp the habitats of native plants and the animals that rely on them. They can decrease biodiversity, we think, maybe, we're not real sure about that yet, but at the very <coughs> least, they can decrease the amount of native plants in an area. So even if, for instance, there were 100 species all within a given area, those 100 species of native plants may just be one here, one there, one there, and this invasive plant has taken over. So. Um, so the biodiversity may remain the same, but the biomass of those natives causes a non-functioning ecosystem. They can retard forest regeneration in that natural succession. So different plants can do different things. Um, in the disrupt category, we should be thinking about the value of native and invasive fruit-bearing shrubs for migrating songbirds. And the Meadows area has, is very known for its um, important floodplain forest for migratory birds. So that's one thing we'll be looking at on the property we own. Which species are there and what harm is it causing to the canopy trees that those migratory birds need for their nesting, refueling, not really nesting, but refueling, um, and other songbirds for, that actually live there and what their needs are. And it turns out that this, um, this uh, Susan Smith that wrote this article for Northeast East Naturals looked at a lot of different species and compared which species were good for songbirds and which weren't. And it turns out that a lot of the invasives were not good for, um, for migratory songbirds. But not all, so it's not just a broad brush thing. Um, and that's something I need to study up on now that I know that I need to help figure out what to do in our Mill River and other floodplain forest areas. So if you think about the need for breeding birds, too, to feed their young, um, it turns out that Doug Tallamy, an uh, entomologist from the um, University of Delaware, he's been doing a lot of research to look at the use of native versus non-native plants for insects. And it turns out that because our native insects have co-evolved with our native plants, the native plants are really, really important for sustaining the insect population. And of course, that then translates into the food birds and other animals need for food and keeping their young fed and growing. 
turns out that invasive plants were almost, in a lot of cases, sterile. They, they weren't supporting any insect life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a pretty neat book that Doug has written. It's called Bringing Nature Home. Um, and it, it has a list of all the different species of trees and I think maybe shrubs as well and how many species of wildlife those support. It's pretty, pretty neat. So there's been research that's also been done about nesting success. For instance, the wood thrush in a, a study done um, in Illinois showed that the, the wood thrush could, um, their, their nests were not successful when they were in common buckthorn and the myrrh honeysuckle as compared to the hawthorn and viburnum, the native plants. And a similar study down in Connecticut on the Norwalk Islands showed that there was a higher predation rate on nestlings when, when the nests were in Moro's honeysuckle and Japanese barberry that was out in the open and wineberry than in the native shrubs in the area. Interestingly, there was still good success rate in multiflora rose. So, um, so just goes to show that invasive plants aren't all bad for all things. So some of the mechanisms they use to cause problems, they can successfully invade in forests, densely occupy space, shade, overtop or smother other plants, <coughs> they can emit toxins called the leotaphy, change the soil and change the fire regime. Um, just some examples of potential for dispersal. That's swallow word on the left here. You can see the wispy seeds like milkweed seeds so they can really blow in the wind. Um, some are dispersed by water, just fragments like Japanese knotweed, for instance, and this is um, Japanese stillgrass shown here. Um, that's a new invader that I hope that you'll learn tonight. Goutweed is another one that can, um, just the fragments can survive in the water and then take hold in floodplain areas. And then birds and other animals will disperse fruit and other seeds in the fur or by eating them and then um, defecating them out. A good example of that is there's a study done in Connecticut um, by uh, Nancy LaFleur looking at European starlings, another invasive exotic animal in this case, and she watched to see how long it took for particular invasive species to go through the digestive system and how far the birds would go in that amount of time. And so she found that the bird would travel 400 meters in 30 minutes for the autumn olive and multiflora rose to come back out, and um, 500 meters in 40 minutes for um, for the I think that was the Oriental bittersweet. And it turns out that some species they um, can actually germinate even better after they've gone through the gut. So, so that's another way that these plants can disperse. They, deer are a big, are a big disperser. They can overbrowse the native vegetation and then giving the exotics more of a um, foothold. And then deer, deer themselves can transport they have a pretty wide range, so they can go up to three kilometers or almost two miles and um, poop out the invasive seeds. Um, there's a, a study showing that honeysuckle, Guatemala, multiflora rose, and wineberry were all dispersed that way, and even just getting stuck on, on uh, hooves and, and fur. And then we can do the same thing. <coughs> Think about our our soles of our boots and what they can pick up in the mud. So this study was done in the UK um, showing that most seeds that they, they had they had a hiker stand in mud that was full of seeds and they found that most of them would fall off in a, a fairly short amount of time and and distance. But some would stand for a full five kilometers. So think about how 
far into your trail system or across town that could that could be dispersing. And some have really really, really aggressive root systems like Phragmites and Japanese knotweed is another good example of that. You know, they can top up through concrete even. <laughs> this is a uh, aerial view of our Fort River division in Hadley that I mentioned off Moody Bridge Road. So um, you can see the forest going down the center there. That's um, the Fort River and the floodplain forest along that river. So we, we got that property to protect the floodplain forest as well as to try to convert a lot of the ag land and um, hay fields to grasslands for grassland bird restoration. And one of our big issues is Asiatic bittersweet, and that plant has been studied by uh, Christian Marks from the Nature Conservancy. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to meet him. He's based here in Northampton. He's been studying the floodplain forest along the whole Connecticut River. And it's his opinion that it's the Oriental bittersweet that's really been doing the most damage to our canopy trees. So not only is that plant able to climb up, as you can see here, climb up and just <coughs> gather all the sunlight, preventing sunlight from getting to the native trees, but also um, if there's an ice storm and there's all that weight from all these vines, especially if the leaves have, haven't fallen off yet, this ice just gets kicked on these vines and further weakens the tree, and I don't know if you noticed during that big ice storm a couple years ago how <coughs> how many trees came down, and if you look closely, a lot of them were full of these vines, not only oriental bittersweet, but that was, that was a major one. The other thing that Christian pointed out on the Mill River uh, property was um, these young trees that were going to be the future forest that are just, you know, saplings, and those were getting totally overrun with bittersweet. So that's going to need to be a priority for us, we know, um, for our control efforts and our restoration efforts for that area. That's bittersweet, that's the kind of the um, rougher bark winding up a tree. You can see that it'll actually girdle trees it needs something else to go up, but sometimes that's it's another vine of its own species, or maybe another species. I've seen grapevine and Asiatic bittersweet growing together. So <coughs> I've put these in so you could see kind of what different bittersweets look like. They can cling to a tree, but they don't have little rootlets um, like poison ivy does. They just um, wind, <coughs> wind around themselves. And if you're um, not familiar with this plant, it does have a couple different leaf shapes. You can see down in the lower left, more of a pointy, longer pointy leaf, um, a lot of teeth along the edges. And then the upper one is on the left is more rounded, but they all do have a point. On them. Sometimes they look a little glossier, and the, the flower is, is pretty inconspicuous, just a, a white flower. The young ones, um, that side there, could be pulled out. So that is one method of, of control. Um, they have an orange root, as you can see in the lower right. That's another way to identify them if you get to see the root. <coughs> Later in the presentation, I'll tell how to control each of these three species. The multiflora rose is another one that Fred asked about because he knew that, that there was a lot of it here in the meadows. Um, this is Rosa multiflora, so many, many flowers on these plants. Actually quite pretty, um, and it also has a lot of the rose hips, so many more seeds to be dispersed. And that could be identified from other roses by this um, fringe stipule. 
at the base of the leaf. Mm -hmm. So it's a compound leaf. Um, this is all one leaf with many leaflets. And right at the base, right here, um, it's fringed, the fringed. So none of the other ones have that, that level of fringiness to them. And as you can see, it can really take over. Um, become so dense that access becomes a big issue. And that's what we're finding in our Fort River Division. So much of our property is covered with multiple floor rows, and um, we had a, a student conservation association group and a youth conservation corps trying to build a trail down there, and they had to work their way through the multiple floor rows. We had a um, we had a crew that came out from Utah that was doing inventory work across the nation at different refuges, and they got here, and and it kind of sent them screaming away <laughs> very far. <laughs> but um, my favorite story with this one is, is uh, Jeff Taylor from Meditation Control Services has done a lot of work on our Mount Tom property to control um, tail swallow wart and we, we let them, his crew, control other things that they encounter along the way as they're controlling the, the swallow wart. And I noticed that Multiflora rose was always addressed, no matter what. And I asked Jeff about that, and he told me that he has it in for multiflora <laughs> rose because he was out snowshoeing one time in the winter time, and he fell through, and it happened to be a multiflora rose patch that he fell into, <laughs> and his snowshoes got all tangled up and all the thorns into his pant legs, and he couldn't get out. <laughs> so ever since then, he's, he's had it in for multiflora. <laughs> a lot of these species are getting started from ornamental planting. So the species we're talking about tonight, the um, multiflora rose, the oriental bittersweet, and garlic mustard were all brought in intentionally. Garlic mustard not necessarily for ornamental purposes, but a lot of others are. Um, that bright red against the house, that <laughs> burning bush. The more burgundy one in the front is Japanese barberry. Um, it could be, I'm not sure about the, the orange in the back is um, probably Norway maple. So a lot of these are really pretty plants and people brought them in for ornamental purposes and that's where they first get started. So if any of your properties back up into from a residential area or other area that would have ornamental planting, that's where you need to be watching for these. <laughs> Japanese barberry um, is one that was in that picture, the burgundy one there um, behind the mailbox. <laughs> this one can actually change the soil pH once it gets into great big patches and <clears throat> birds will eat it and disperse it. And this is what can happen in a forested situation and in a pasture situation. So deer won't eat it because it's got the thorns and, um, and yet the deer will eat what else is around there. So this can end up taking over. And it turns out that this is a, an issue more in areas that had been open during a certain era when this plant was planted and then as <coughs> that land grows up to forest, the plant takes over. Mm -mm. The other issue that was found about Japanese barberry is that there's a higher incidence of Lyme disease where there's a lot of Japanese barberry. And it turns out that the tick, the deer tick, likes the humid area underneath these dense shrubs. Mm -hmm. So it's not only Japanese barberry, but some of the other invasive plants that grow really densely, like um, some of the exotic bush honeysuckles too. So down in um, this was this was researched at the Connecticut Agri Connecticut Agro Agricultural Experiment Station, and they found that when they controlled the Japanese barberry, that um, the Lyme disease went down. Um, the incidence of Lyme disease went down from the area. So 
a human health um, impact as well. Some invasives are shade tolerant and they just persist in the understory and then when a, a gap is opened up, they, um, they flourish. Uh, the buckthorns are a good example of that. Um, it's a glossy buckthorn. <coughs> honeysuckle is another example. There are native honeysuckles, so not to be confused with these exotic um, invasives. Swallowworts, they do best in the sun, but they will survive, especially the pale will survive in uh, shade. So that would be a problem in both open and closed situations. So in the meadows, I would guess that this could be a really big issue. This is one that we're battling up on Mount Tom. <laughs> you can see how dense it can get. And this one is related to the um, common milkweed. You might know that common milkweed is used by monarch butterflies as a food plant. The monarchs um, lay their eggs on milkweed, the larvae feed on it, and then the adults nectar on other things as well as the milkweed. Well, because this swallowwort is related, monarchs can be confused, lay their eggs on the swallowwort and their life larvae don't survive. Mm -hmm. So, um, as if monarchs didn't have a big enough problem going on with their um, overwintering grounds disappearing. <laughs> so, I just wanted to throw in some examples of what we're doing on our properties, um, a little bit that, that we are doing at this point in time. So, there are some rare plants up on Mount Tom working with the Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. They, they bring their staff up to help us. Um, we had been hiring a contractor there on the right, that is Jeff Taylor, who fell into the multiple road, um, to come up with this huge truck full of herbicide and they would spot treat using this hose. Um, spot treat the, the uh, they'll swallow warts and, and then around the rare plants we kept a buffer and natural heritage would use the glove weight technique on the, the swallow wart and then out from there use uh, backpack sprayers. So we ran out of money to hire vegetation control services. Um, we just had to pretty much give up on the huge expanses of pale swallowwort because it's just so entrenched. And we're still working right around the rare plants trying to kind of hold the battle line so that they're protected. Um, so we're still doing that. <coughs> no longer the big effort. <laughs> Some plants emit toxins that impact the growth of their neighbors. This is called a lelopathy. And garlic mustard, one of your chosen species for tonight, um, is one of those. Um, so this is what garlic mustard looks like. It's got a two-year life cycle. The first year is on the left here. It just grows as a rosette. And the leaves are kind of like violets or green charlie. Um, and then it both the second year it has a pretty tall you know, ranges, a flowering stalk that can range up to you know, three or four feet. Um, and then goes to seed with those long thin uh, seed pods with multiple seeds that can remain viable for five to seven years. So keep that in mind that when these seeds remain viable for so long, you can't just go in, if it's already dropped seeds, you're looking at for this plant another five to seven years before you can catch up with it. <coughs> so, uh, Christina Stinson, who's now at University of Massachusetts actually, she, in her research, she found that the garlic mustard emits this chemical that prevents the mycorrhizal fungi that assist native plants to uptake nutrients. It disrupts that, that process that chemical that, that um, the garlic mustard emits. So what she found is that was actually impacting the biomass in an area of sugar maple, red maple, and white ash. 
to the whole regeneration of the forest. And I know that a lot of the um, spring ephemeral wildflowers were impacted as well. So this can grow in the sun and the shade. And it has uh, a relationship with a butterfly, kind of like the swallowwort that I described. That's a, a, a rare mustard white butterfly. And its regular host plant is um, a related mustard. And instead, it sometimes lays its eggs on the garlic mustard. Originally, they were finding that there was no survival of these larvae, but um, it seems to be adapting to some degree to it now. Mm -hmm. So, to get a sense of some of the control measures that are used for um, invasives. So stopgap measure can just be pulling off seed pods, and that's what we've had to do sometimes up at Mount Tom, is, okay, let's just get those swallow work seed pods if we can't do anything else. Um, hand pulling can work on some species. Garlic mustard is one of those. Um, but it's no good. This is us trying to pull kale swallow work from around the rare plants when we didn't have permission yet to use any herbicide in the area. And it was just useless, you know. It, it just kept popping up from the fragments. So we found that kale swallowwort is one of those that pretty much needs herbicide in order to control it, unless you only have few plants where you can actually dig up the whole root system. And that, that is effective. Mechanical control, brush cutters, weed wrenches, um, Cutting, mowing, digging, covering with black plastic. So all of those can work, but you have to know which species each of those is good for. <laughs> Herbicide treatment, um, use backpack sprayer. You can uh, put herbicide on the cut stump or stem, and that's a, a really good method for the oriental bittersweet. So um, we'll get to that when we're, we're talking <coughs> about oriental literacy. But um, in this particular case, the Natural Heritage Program started to try to treat our kale swallowwort around the rare plants this way. And it only took him about a half hour to realize this is crazy. You know, he does it like this big of an area in a half an hour. And, um, and so that's when we graduated to the glove weight technique. So, Kind of a trial and error kind of thing. So what that is is it sounds really gross actually. You put um, a rubber glove on, pinch your hand, and we have some that are really high, and then a cotton glove over that. You dip your hand into the herbicide solution, squeeze it out, and then wipe the wipe the stem and all the bottoms of the leaves along that stem. So that, that is one way. The reason we use that is that it doesn't drip and get onto other plants. Mm -hmm. It's only used in areas where, you know, you have the time and it's important to protect everything else in that area around it. Mm -hmm. um, and there are classes you can take to learn how to use it safely right here at UMass. Mm -hmm. So, just get to the control of those three species. The garlic mustard can just be hand pulled. So this is one of the easiest plants to to um, try to control. When, when you hand pull it, then what do you do with the plant? Well, that's more of the issue. <laughs> what do you do with it? Yeah. Um, what we've done before is put it in plastic bags, closing it up tightly, and just put it out in the sun and baking it. And then, um, yeah. <laughs> what's that? For seven years. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I'm glad you said that. When you say seven years, it's because the seeds remain viable for seven years, right? Well, you do that before it produces seeds in a given year. So you do it um, while it's in flowering stages. It's, a, it's the easiest time to find it because it's in flower. But yeah, if it's already gone to seed, 
there's no point because just the, well, I have. I have gone up and snipped seed heads off carefully without bursting them, putting them into a bucket, then putting them into a plastic bag, and then disposing them like in a landfill or burning them, that kind of thing. Mm. So that's when you know you really want to protect a, a certain area or it's a new infestation mm. that just started. You know that this is the first year it's going to go to seed. There are no seeds in that system yet. Um, it's worth going through those kinds of measures to keep that seed from falling. New England Wildflower Society does a lot of invasive plant control and what they do with their garlic mustard and other invasives, they just have this huge pile on one of their properties and they just put everything there. They try to do everything before anything has put forth any seeds. Okay, so it's all this vegetative growth, flowering growth. Um, and then they watch. They watch the perimeter and if anything is growing out from there, they pull it. So at least it's all contained in one area. And I think that's a pretty good way of doing it to prevent a lot from going into the landfill, um, to just not have to deal with these bags full of stuff. So that is another option. But um, know that garlic mustard, if it's already flowering, it can still produce seeds if you pull it out of the ground. So it's got enough reserves left in it to produce seed. So you do have to bag it up even if it's flowering. So a good time to really get it is before it's even started flowering at all. And then you don't have to worry so much about disposal. Mm -mm. You can also cut the stem really, really low. Um, when there's a lot of it, that takes a lot more time than pulling it. But the one thing about pulling this plant is if it's already um, gone to seed in previous years, um, then you're disrupting the soil and maybe bringing more disturbance to the soil, causing a bare area for those seeds to germinate and grow well next year. Mm -hmm. Does mowing kill it off? Or Mowing can, can help a lot, yeah, yeah. You probably would have to do it multiple times because the cut stem will still grow and still produce seeds. So you can't just think you can cut it once and then it'll be done. Mm -mm. So garlic mustard, it because it's such an easy plant to pull, um, it does pop out of the ground pretty easily and the roots usually come out with it. Um, it's one that is really good for community efforts. Um, <laughs> Parties. What's that? Parties. Parties, yeah. There's a, a group out of Michigan called the Stewardship Network, and they're expanding out to new areas. New England is the first one place where it's expanding to. So I'm really excited about this. And they've done this garlic mustard challenge for years now. And what they do is different groups, um, organized groups that are like watershed based or county based, they all get together, they keep track of how much they pull out by pounds and they turn it in. So they keep track of all of it. So it's a, it's a contest. And then I don't think there's any big prize or anything except notoriety if you win. So we think that we should, in New England, just all as New England, mm -hmm. join this and <laughs> see what we come up with. <coughs> Cynthia, mm -hmm. in the previous slide where you showed the, uh, uh, the plant with the seed pods over on the right, yep. they, they're still worth pulling at that stage, aren't they? Because by and large they haven't started to shed seed. Yes, yeah. If they're just green like this, it takes a while. Like they'll look like this for a long time before mm -hmm. they turn brown and those seeds are falling out. So even though there's no leaves left to speak of in July, early July, even late June, you can still be pulling this plant. Yeah, yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Uh, well, related to the same plant. Mm -hmm. So if you go around your garden and you weed, and then you have a sort of informal compost heap for those weeds, it's a little bit like what you were talking about, about just dumping everything in one place, or not. 
If you use your compost pile, you mean? Yeah. So you have a special one for weeds. Oh, yeah, yeah, you could do that. But um, but I wouldn't put it in a compost pile because there's there's soil attached to those roots that may have seeds from previous years, and that would get mixed up with your compost, and then you'd be dispersing it into your garden or other places where you use that compost. So, so yeah, all all invasive plant stuff should go in a special place where it it either is composted with high heat, which usually isn't possible, um, or just not composted at all. Just let it be there. <laughs> The Oriental Bittersweet Control. Um, this one, as I mentioned before, you can pull out the small seedlings and that can be effective because you can get the whole plant. But, um, but if the root breaks, it still has the potential of, of growing from the fragments. So <coughs> what we're doing, uh, what seems to be the recommended procedure, um, is well, what we're doing temporarily. This isn't this isn't the recommended. This is recommended if you don't if you can't use herbicide at all. And that is at least try to get these plants that are growing up into the trees. Keep kill those, um, or at least kill what's what's up in the trees already. So cutting at ground level and then up higher so that those plants will regrow. Okay, you haven't killed them, you've just kind of knocked them back. So what's up in the tree now will not be getting any nutrients. So that'll die, that'll decay, that'll fall out of the trees, and the trees will now have a better chance of survival. But, um, but that plant will re-sprout. So what you want to do is, the best thing to do would be to treat that cut stem with herbicide, either a glyphosate or a trichopure product. We're not able to do that yet. We don't have the permission to, to do that. So we're doing the two cuts for the time being, stopgap measure, and then, um, then the other thing that can be done is when it regrows, you can do a foliar spray on the regrow. So that's been found to be real effective too. So that's if you were to do those two cuts um, mm -hmm. and you were to keep track of it over a period of years, would the stuff that was down at the ground level eventually die or would it just keep, keep it'll, on? It'll, it'll keep going and it'll yeah. eventually start up that tree again. Yeah. That's why you do the upper cut too yeah. so that new growth doesn't just grab on to that old stem <laughs> and have something yeah. grow up. And then multiflora rose, that one can actually be plucked out. I showed you that. Did I show you the picture of the weed wrench? No. 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 So, so weed wrenches are these orange, big, bulky sticks that use leverage for getting popping out weeds. So you attach it to the um, stem and then pluck it out. This plant can actually be pulled out, but of course it's got these thorns, so it's not the easiest thing. You know, you use leather gloves, you protect yourself well. And our poor um, Youth Conservation Corps has spent a lot of time pulling out multiflora rows. That's another one where herbicide can be effective on the regrowth. And the best time to cut all these woody invasives is in the spring after they've put out all their leaves, so they've taken a lot of that root energy and put it up into leaves. Now the roots are weakened, so by cutting it then, you cut it at the best time. Um, and multiple cuts like that could probably weaken it over time, multiple springs and or as soon as it regrows. Um, but treating the regrowth with herbicide can be just the and the final, easier method. Um, so those are, can I add that? Sure, yeah. Um, goats are really good. Yeah. Oh. 
Well, that's another another thing to consider. Is uh, I think there might be someone local who left their goats out to do invasive control. <laughs> the goat girls. Have you heard of them? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know anything about their business or anything, but thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah, and um, there are certain species of plants that will succumb to grazing like that. And, and another thing to keep in mind on the downside of using grazing is if plants are being consumed that have seeds on them, the seeds could go through the digestive tract and end up in new places. But I think it's worth exploring. I think there's been enough... Um, research done on that, that that we have a good sense of what, what will and what won't work. So, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so, the other thing we're doing at the Refuge, as I mentioned, is prioritizing, preventing, and working in partnerships. I'll just go through a little bit of what, what I mean by that. So, early detection, rapid response, like Glow and her um, purple loose stripe that I described. We're also trying to figure out which plants are on her doorstep, which new invaders that most people have never even heard of. Figure out what's on its way, what's just beginning to get started in our area. We've been doing some workshops. We had one in Arcadia uh, this spring to teach people what to be on the lookout for. Um, those invasives that are in areas where there are rare and endangered species, we try to um, we're trying to figure out how to at least protect those those rare species from the invasives. Um, threats to our other management goals. I mentioned that our goal for our Fort River and our Mill River divisions is to protect those floodplain forests and the canopy trees. So the bittersweet is what's um, really giving that um, habitat an issue. The multiflora rose is another one in the floodplain forest because it's the shade of it is preventing the regeneration of the forest. So we'll probably go after that. And along the riverbanks, um, it's the trees that are that are shading the water and creating the nice cold water fishery habitat. If those trees are brought down by the bittersweet or mm -hmm. they can't regenerate because of the multiflora rose. Um, then again, those two species are good to focus on. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Think about what your management goals are when you're thinking about your area. You know, it might be just providing access, anything that's in the way of your trail, um, or it might be certain species of wildlife, finding out what they need, what's preventing that. Um, I think that's probably the most important thing to keep in mind is the, the goal isn't to just kill invasive plants, it's to get what you want, to, to do the restoration that's needed to protect the wildlife or whatever other goal you might have for that property. Mm -mm. Um, we also try to get those plants that cause the greatest or most immediate threat to native species, and that's another reason why we focus on Scarlet mustard because it emits that toxin, um, it spreads very quickly. So if we can contain that, um, we've done a good thing. So we control with partners too. Not only on our own property do we do work, but we're doing things in the watershed and forming formalized partnerships or involved with formalized partnerships. Mm -hmm. This is one of the workshops that we did um, early detection training so that our friends group up in New Hampshire would know what to be on the lookout for and how to report, report it and how to control it. Mm -hmm. Japanese silk grass is a species that's just getting started in, well, it's not just getting started, it is, it is here and spreading quickly, <coughs> but it's one that's pretty easy to control if you catch it early. So um, most of the seeds will germinate the following year after they're dropped. So what we're finding in the areas where we have done work is um, 
All we're doing is weed whacking or hand pulling, although there are other methods of control, and we've really gotten a handle on some of these new populations, but they are, they're, they haven't been found early enough, and so just the time it takes to get to these huge expansive populations is um, really a concern. So that whole idea of early detection, rapid response is key, and this is a, an important um, species to learn. This is a New Jersey park, um, now it's a park, it looks like a park, probably used to have a lot more going on in it. Mm -hmm. uh, this was taken in Northfield, Massachusetts, so that's the northernmost infestation that we have in the watershed. And it's just a little bit, so we've been actually getting this one under wraps with um, use of volunteers. So it, it's really heartening to, um, to see these when they're discovered early and we can get on top of it. <coughs> Some of you have been involved with um, auto chestnut babies. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a plant that's in Fitzgerald Lake and in our pond over there in the Huckabee Flats. So this is quite because we haven't been talking about it all tonight, but this is another one that could spread really rapidly and we <coughs> started controlling this way back in the refuge and many partners um, started controlling it back in 19... 2000, year 2000. And we really have made a big impact um, where it exists would have been. I'm convinced that these water bodies would have been entirely covered if um, people hadn't been out pulling this plant. But these are some of the kinds of patches we're pulling and that takes, you know, that patch there would probably take about, for those two boats, five minutes. <coughs> so it goes quickly um, there's areas like the Chicopee River where the first year we took out 10 tons, and that's some of the 10 tons that we took out, all with volunteers out of canoes um, and Youth Conservation Corps members. Now, I think we just got a half a ton out of the Chicopee River, so it's really, it's really working. Cynthia, how do you measure that by the actual weight when you pull the plants immediately afterwards? What we're doing is, and this is just to, to kind of um, keep track of the trend, so it's not a end-all, be-all weight. What we're saying is that each garbage bag that we pull out like that is 40 pounds. So you know, it's just kind of a quick and dirty method of, <coughs> of getting a sense of how much we take out from year to year. <laughs> so what took days and days and days of pulling that first year is now down to one day. One day with a good crew. So, um, so it can be done. The Invasive Plant Atlas of New England is a good place to go for information on the web. www.ipain.org has a lot of uh, connections to <coughs> management information, a lot of IV information. <coughs> and that's now connected with another, um, all the information that went into IPAY now is going into a national database. So it's not just New England based now, it's national, and that's called EDMAPS, the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. Um, you can see, um, I guess that's a GPS unit, I think it was a smartphone, but there is a smartphone app now too where you can um, locate an invasive plant, take a picture of it, the GPS coordinates automatically get uploaded into this system called Outsmart Invasive. It's a free phone app, so it's pretty cool. And um, so that goes to this national database and there's folks that you can ask <coughs> who are um, on the other end and verifying that. So you might be pretty sure you've got, you're taking a picture of something, but there is someone on the other end that will actually verify that and, and it'll be noted in the database as verified or not verified. So, so you don't have to be too timid about it. You know, just 
you see something that's amiss and you don't even know what to call it, go ahead and take a picture of it and say it's unknown and you might have discovered something important. Mm -hmm. The other thing that the refuge has done is encouraged the formation of what's called cooperative weed management areas or cooperative invasive species management areas to go beyond plants and into insects and other things. And there are now six of those organizations in the watershed on varying scales all the way from a 14 mile wild and scenic stretch of the Westfield River. That's the, um, or not the Westfield, but the Farmington. That's the little star at the upper end of Connecticut and the Eight Mile Watershed, which is a, a small sub-watershed of the Connecticut, mm -hmm. all the way up to a nine sub-watershed, um, 900,000 acre area up in the Headwaters area. Mm -hmm. So these groups are partnerships of conservation organizations, agencies, both federal and state, uh, individual businesses, the whole gamut all kind of working together in an area that they <coughs> feel strongly about. So it's a way to it's a way to combine efforts. One organization might have a youth crew and another organization may have equipment and another organization might have housing for interns and you put them all together and you can get a lot more done than if each of those groups were trying to do something individually. So um, that's something that you could think about. Bob and I were just talking about how there's the Broadwood Coalition and now Meadow City, and there might be other watershed <coughs> groups in this area that you know it might be worth just having a discussion to see if there's enough interest to, to do something like this. Mm -hmm. So um, feel free to call me or email me if you have questions, more specific questions. I know this is pretty general tonight. Um, this is one of our properties up in New Hampshire, on the Cherry area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What questions do you have now? <coughs> yeah. <coughs> what distinguishes that still grass? The identifying still features? Yeah. Yeah. I don't have that in this. Let me see if any of these. You say you said it's in Northfield. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't really tell you where it is. So it's found in um, the Fanny Stebbins Refuge in Longmeadow. There's a lot of it in East Hampton, mm -hmm. and it's right on the border of. Actually, I think it's in Northampton, right where where Northampton, East Hampton, and West Hampton all come together. That corner. So it's there, and I think there's some conservation lands in Northampton down in that area. I don't think it's gotten up into those yet. Um, other close by Conway Maps is kind of an isolated thing. Um, we've been working there quite a bit with partners there. Um, there's some in Amherst. The thing about this species is that it, it, it's a grass, you know, it looks like other grasses. So um, you really have to know what you're looking for. So I'm glad you asked. Um, what you are looking for is this, I wish I, I do have, if, if people are interested enough, then um, I can stay late till after your business meeting if people want to see this. Um, but what you're looking for is, it doesn't show up in this picture, but these leaves are one to three inches long, sometimes four inches long. They're a little bit wider than a normal grass blade that you might be familiar with. And there's a, a reflective stripe down the center that often looks white or silvery. So in the light, um, it's reflective. So in some light, if it's really cloudy out, that doesn't show up as well. Um, so so that. That's its leaves, and then its roots. Um, this is a better example here. If this was the ground level, it looks like it's standing up on stilts. And some of the other branches that might be coming out will also root. So 
um, so anyway, that's how it got its name, still grass. And it's an annual, so it has really fine roots. And sometimes there's nodules stuck to it. But its lookalike is a perennial, and it has more rough, scaly root system. And its leaves are a little bit longer and narrow, maybe the same width, but longer like seven or eight inches long, and that's Virginia white grass. That's its name look alike. There are other, are other things that do look like it. But what I would suggest for those of you who, um, who would like to try to keep this out of the meadows would be to come to one of the events that we have to um, control this. We've been working mostly in Conway, so it's not all that far away. It's just a really good way to, to get to know the plant, what it looks like when it's growing, how to identify it, and, and best techniques for pulling it. So that would be what I'd suggest. Mm -hmm. um, didn't you also have a problem with, I guess it's kind of invasive, but it's an opportunist, which is Zuma. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions about managing that? Or? Well, that is a native plant. And, and it, it's good for wildlife, so you really have to be sure that it's, it's disrupting a management goal or some other thing. Um, and no, I don't, because I focus on aliens. But I would guess that there would be information you could find, even at UMass. You know, there's weed scientists at UMass that, that deal with unwanted plants. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll bet you could find some good information on that. I could help link you to the right people. <laughs> Anything else? You mentioned that uh, the garlic mustard produces chemicals that inhibit the growth of other plants. Are there are any other of these local invasives that do that as well? Spotted knapweed is one that will do that. In fact, it's such a potent chemical that it emits that they've um, that they're now distilling this chemical for a naturally based herbicide. <laughs> <laughs> There's anecdotal experience that someone uh, has reported in. Someone who out west just pulled this day after day after day after day and he ended up with a tumor on his hand. He swears that it was from pulling spotted napoli and of course there's no way to know that for sure. Uh, water chestnut, you, uh, somebody mentioned that you recommend trying to remove as much of the root system as possible. Yes. Even though the seed pods are really uh, near the, uh, on the plant itself or slightly below the plant, even though you might have another several feet of roots. Right. Yeah, the, the question is about water chestnut, how much of the plant you really need to get out even though the, the, the part that goes to seed is um, floating on the surface of the water and the roots may be quite a ways down embedded in the muck. Um, we do recommend that you pull out the whole plant because if it snaps, that plant can regrow. And so it all kind of depends on how much time it's got left to, <coughs> to regrow, form rosettes, go to flower, go to seed. So at the end of the season, we're plucking off those rosettes um, and just doing that. But most of the time, we try to pull the whole thing out so we don't have to come back to that site again. And it is good to go back a to a site a second time just to see if you missed anything. And I know you guys do that at Fitzgerald. Um, you usually have a couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Arcadia has water chestnut too, and they they pretty much, as they're at the same stage, are just kind of keeping keeping it in check. Um, but we've had major successes with with getting that down to a point where just a canoe or two can keep up with it. You've been working up on in Mount Tom, right? Bray Lake. Yeah, thanks for doing it. You know, there was a, we 
pulled, it's interesting to note that we pulled, uh, I remember the date, J uh, July 11th, <laughs> we pulled it out and then there was regrowth later on in the summer at the end of August, or early September, because there was one little confined area that we, mm -hmm. that we was readily observable. I and we were surprised when uh -huh. one of your people called up and said, hey, there's more water chestnut. Right. And it wasn't that we missed it. That's interesting. Yeah. Because we don't normally see that it where all if you've grew gotten back. a whole... Because we're all small. In fact, some of them were small plants. And I was curious uh, how how long it takes them to germinate, the small plants. So so do you feel like you have gotten the whole plant, that they weren't snapping at all, that you had gotten the roots and everything? Actually, I went in there because I had to go into that section with waders because we couldn't get in there with our canoes and kayaks. Mm -hmm. So, and it was near the uh, uh, the uh, platform that you look out, if you're familiar with it, Bradley. Mm -hmm. um, so, we knew, we had been there, and then Bill Finn called me up and said, hey, there's more there. Yeah. And so I went back again with waiters, and we got it again at the end of August or early September. I don't know what's going on there. I really don't. If you think that you got the whole route, and everything. Yeah, we got most of it. Yeah. Not everything, but... Um, well, maybe what was left, that's what, that's what regrew, you know. And those small plants can snap off pretty easily. That's what yeah. we find is there's this, it's hard to know. If you go early enough and the rosettes are small, you can get, you can prevent large mats from forming pretty easily. But those, if they snap, they can regrow. So, you know, you have to come back. But it, I think it's still worth the, the extra visits in order to not have these bags and bags full I, of I'm curious whether some of those were new plants that grew later in the season. That's possible. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't really, we usually just go out once because we go to 25 different sites in the watershed, so we go once and we hope that we got it all and there wasn't more, but we don't really know that. Yeah, that's to be what's happening. Mm -hmm. well, what's the main way in which stillgrass spreads? So stillgrass is a an annual, mm -hmm. and <coughs> so if you if you kill that plant, you kill that plant. Mm -hmm. um, and if it goes to seed, then the seeds can get transported. They're small. They can get stuck in tires. We found in Conway, it's really interesting, um, <coughs> there are infestations at all the mailboxes. Oh. 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 So, what do you do about that, you know? You can't have the mail truck washing off its tires <laughs> between every stop. <laughs> but that's a good place for, you know, the citizens to be on the lookout, okay? We know this popping up in mailboxes. That's where, that's one of the first places you need to look. Animal hooves, fur. To get caught in the fur, yeah. Hiking boots, um, hmm. equipment. We think, we think that some of it's coming into our area on equipment that's used for controlling vegetation and uh, power lines. Because there's some new infestations in power lines. There's the East Hampton property. We think that got started from a logging operation. And we're thinking maybe the, the equipment was used someplace that had an infestation and they came up and worked there. So log landing is a real good place to be on the lookout for stiltgrass along waterways if, if you know that there's an infestation higher up in the watershed because it can disperse by water. Oh, too. really? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so what plants would you say that weed rich? I was kind of fascinated by that. What What's that most effective in removing? Good for... Honeysuckles, um, small woody, woody plants that have a big enough stem that you can really get something <coughs> braced on it. Yeah. Um, 
So not super deep root system. So honeysuckles is one of the best. Mm. There's another thing called a something popper. Can't remember exactly what it is, mm. but actually Lee Rent is um, that company has actually gone under, so I think they're selling out all the rest of their stock. But there's a new company that's, that's selling something similar. <coughs> I have that information at the office. I can't remember what it is. I do have pictures of the weed ranch in another presentation, so I can show that to anybody who wants to stay after and see that. Well, we had tried the weed ranch several years ago at Fitzgerald Lake, and multi stem. Uh, Plants were very difficult, if not impossible, to get at. Yeah, I can imagine that just because they would have such a yeah. a dispersed. You know, if you could only put it around one of those stems, it just yeah, that would well, be tricky. We we tried it on buckthorn, glossy buckthorn in particular, and it just we couldn't get anywhere with it. Uh -huh. because, in part because the root system is is very well developed. In yeah. The buckthorns are tough. That's another one where, unfortunately, herbicide is probably the best way to go. Yeah, I have one question. Um, you mentioned and alluded in the presentation to um, various collaborative efforts. Yeah. What kinds of collaborations are you open to discussing in the future, given the amount um, of work you have? Yeah. Good question. Yeah, things just kind of evolve. <laughs> so um, if we're thinking about this particular area, for instance, there might be some opportunity where we're doing work on our land in this area and if there's other properties that have a similar situation or rare species or something like that, we might be able to bring resources <coughs> to it. But most of that kind of thing I think would take getting a grant or extra funds to do that. Right This year we are thinking about having to cut back on our Youth Conservation Corps and reduce our water chestnut project. Maybe we won't be able to go to every place. So. I hate to make any big promises or anything like that, but um, but what I would encourage is more you know, we could help a group that might want to form one of those cooperative invasive species management areas with supplying the information on how to do that and you know, what steps are needed to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, connect you up with other groups that might be doing something similar. Mm -mm. So maybe someone back here, one more question. One more question, and then was there another question? Okay. No. Well, thank you so much.